So I'm going to read from Isaiah, right? The seventh chapter, the 10th through the 16th verse. Six verses. The situation here is that there is a new king named Ahaz. And Ahaz is not getting a very good start to the kingship. And Ahaz is, uh, the, the peace of the kingdom is threatened. So these words, oh, and God wants to give Ahaz a sign that um, God is with him. God is with the people of God. And Ahaz, hmm. He's not too sure about this. So here we go. Again, the Lord spoke to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign of the Lord your God. Let it be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. But Ahaz said, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. Then Isaiah said, Well, hear then, O house of David. Is it too little for you to weary mortals, that you weary my God also? Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Look, the young woman is with child and shall bear a son, and you shall name him Emmanuel. He shall eat curds and honey by the time he knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good. For before the child knows how to refuse the evil and choose the good, the land before whose two kings you are in dread will be deserted. Well, do you want a peaceful Christmas? <laughs> I was talking to my brother this week, and he said, John, I am not going to have a peaceful Christmas, hence the question up here. I said, why not, Mark? There are going to be three dogs in my house on Christmas Day. I hate dogs. <laughs> I won't give you all the details of how and why three dogs are going to end up in his house on that day. But I was rather amused. Oh, my. Do we want a peaceful Christmas? Ahaz would like peace. But he's going to have trouble. God promises him a sign that his kingship will not end. But Ahaz resists. It is 734 B.C. Ahaz is the new king in Judah. And his palace, of course, is in the capital city of Jerusalem. He is there. And two other nations have asked him to join their coalition to resist the northern power of Assyria. Assyria would be modern-day Iraq. And Isaiah warns Ahaz, do not join their coalition against Assyria. It won't work. So he doesn't, 
and promptly Israel, the northern kingdom, and Aram, the other kingdom that's against Assyria, attack Jerusalem and besiege it. And so Ahaz is afraid. Will his kingship be doomed before it even almost begins? God wants to give a sign that God has larger purposes in mind than any that Ahaz has. And so God uh, promises a sign. A young woman will have a child, and that child will be named Emmanuel. Now, we do not know, it's never mentioned anywhere in the scriptures, if that child was born in the palace of Ahaz. There's no indication it was that it ever happened. But of course, we as Christians celebrate that that sign that was there for peace would be fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He would be born of a virgin and he would fulfill the prophecies of Isaiah. He would have the names Everlasting Father, Mighty God, Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace. Peace is promised. Now, Ahaz is not particularly spiritual, evidently, because God asks, Ahaz to ask for a sign. It's almost like God condescends here and says, okay, you're not very spiritual. Well, then I'll let you ask for a sign. I, I don't recommend asking for signs from God um, unless God tells you. If God says, ask for a sign, then I suggest you ask for one. Okay? Okay. Um, God says, ask for a sign. Uh, it could be as deep as Sheol or as high as heaven. In other words, this could be a big sign, expansive. Woohoo! And I'll do it. But what does Ahaz say? It's rather interesting. He says, I will not ask. And I will not put the Lord to the test. Now, what we know about Ahaz is this. He had a penchant, you could say, for superstition and fear. Those two often go together, by the way, superstition and fear. He would eventually reinstitute from Canaanite influence child sacrifice in Judah. And at one place in the scriptures, it says Ahaz put his own son through the fire which I take to mean he sacrificed his own son to get some protection. It's awful, isn't it? Ahaz also is said by Isaiah that he wearies mortal. That is, he treats people not very well. And because he doesn't treat people very well, because he's so full of fear and all, 
he ends up treating God not very well. If you treat people poorly, you usually treat God poorly. And so here's the challenge. How do we have peace? A child will be named Emmanuel, God with us. And we can have that mind of Christ to help us with peace. Jesus is the prince of peace. So how do we make peace? I read a book, finished it just this week, The Anatomy of Peace by the Arbinger Institute. I want to take some things, and I've adapted them a bit, I want to take some things from that book and wed it to what I know of the peace that God wants for us. And so here we go. Are you ready for this? You want a peaceful Christmas? Here, here we have, how do we make peace in the world? How do we do that in a world that's so full of strife? Well, let's put this up. Next slide. First of all, you see at the top there's a triangle and the word doing is up there, right? And that's how we act, all right? We do things. So someone might say something nice about you. I like your beard, okay? I wish I could grow that beard. I can't grow a beard, so I'm left out of that. But anyway, I like it. You have a beautiful beard, all right? So there it is. All right, somebody says something nice about it. I said something nice, right? All right. So that's what we do. We may give an act of kindness. We may serve somehow. It's what we do. But there's also another thing. It's the way of being. And it's how we feel and act. Or not feel. It's how we feel and think about people. Okay? And that's being. We react to both how what people do and what how people are towards us, how they feel, how they think about us. Okay? We react to both. We may think we act primarily just to doing, but it's really both. And then here's the deal. If we're going to relate to people properly with the love of Christ, we need to have a heart at peace, a heart of peace. And how do you know you have a heart of peace? Because you treat people as people. And it says here that people have hopes and needs that are as real to me as my own, okay? So maybe you have a hope then for uh, changing the world. That hope is as real to me then as it would be to you because I value you, all right? So it's a hope a need, if you have need for shelter and protection, I want to honor that as much as I do for myself. If you have a need to belong, I want to honor that, that you should belong just like I need to belong. All right, so hopes and needs are as real for us as they are for others. We treat people as treat people. But there's another way. It's the heart at war and a heart at war people are objects so when Ahaz killed his son to try to protect himself from enemies and thinking he'd have that was he treating his son as an object or a person an object, wasn't he? And how do we know we treat people as objects? 
Well, we see them as obstacles. Oh, you're in the way of me and what I want. We see them as threats. You're going to hurt me. You're going to harm me, okay? Or as a means to an end. Oh, I need to manipulate you so I can get this done. Or something to be used. I'll use you for this. Or, well, you, you just don't matter to me. You're irrelevant. Now, here's the deal. Do you notice that heart at peace is like a circle, but a heart at war is like a box? When we're in the heart of war, we box people in, and we box ourselves in. And it can be awful. And here is a truth that I had not thought about till I read this book. Here, let's put it up. We respond more to others' way of being toward us rather than to their behavior. And we respond to both. I'm not saying both matter, but it's this. We will respond to how people think and feel about us, and that might matter more than what they do. So you, we, we've all had this happen. Somebody does something nice for us, but we know they don't like us. They're mad at us. They hate us. And that gift does not go very far, does it? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> Sometimes, I don't, I don't know, pr probably no one in here has ever had a rebellious child. I had one. But uh, um, a rebellious child, and, and sometimes I did the right thing with my rebellious child. I was patient. I set a boundary. He broke the boundary. I, I, I warned him ahead of time. You break this boundary, this is the consequence. It's real natural. And I was completely patient and instituted the, but it didn't matter. You know why? Because I had a heart of war. I had a heart of war. He is making my life miserable. And I gave off enough vibes that he knew it. All right? So, how do we know we have a heart at war? And it's this. We treat people as objects, and usually when we treat them as objects, we will self-justify somehow. So, it goes like this. There's somebody at Christmas you're wanting to avoid. You don't want them around. You don't want to talk to them? All right? This is hypothetical, okay? And here's how we justify it. I'm better than that person. I would never do what he or she has done. Okay? Or I deserve this. I deserve some peace and quiet. I deserve to be left alone. Okay? I deserve whatever it is you deserve. We say we deserve it. Okay? Or, now this is interesting. Some people don't think of this as self-justifying. I'm worse than this person. I'm worse than. So, yeah, yeah. So maybe the rebellious teenager says that, right? I'm worse than my parent, so I just act worse. All right, we justify it. I'm worse than. Um, and then the need to be seen as. <laughs> so this is like, I need to be seen as good. 
I need to be seen as right. I am right. I may not be loving, but I'm right. <laughs> okay? I, I need to be seen as perfect. I need to be seen as flexible. I need to be seen whatever it is. We justify our behavior towards another person with our heart at war. We're allowed to be at war with them because of all these things we justify. So Ahaz justified that he couldn't, he didn't have to be obedient to God because God demanded too much. Couldn't trust God. So if God asks you to ask for a sign, no, no way. Treated God as an object. Isn't that something? So here we are. All this peace needs to happen. But how does it happen? And I think that Jesus can help us get out of the box. Because Jesus can give us his mind and his heart of peace. And so sometimes I pray, Lord, help me to see this person as you see them, as you see them. Okay? This is terribly important. Do you know that nations can treat other nations as objects? Not really people. They're objects. We can treat certain groups of people as objects. Now, whatever you feel about this country's immigration policies, I'll tell you something that should not happen. We should not have a heart of war against immigrants. Whether we institute policies that these people can be allowed in and these people cannot and we, we have this structure and this structure, we should not have a heart of war. Because if we have a heart of war, we will treat immigrants as what? Objects. And if we treat them as objects, we will do things to them that we wouldn't do to our own family. There may be a time, and it's very seldom in my mind, that a nation has to go to war with another nation. You could argue that we had to go to war with Japan and Nazi Germany at World War II. You could argue that. We, we all could argue that, right? But we need to go to war with a heart of peace. So that we treat enemies as what? People with hopes and dreams as real as ours. Because if we don't, any nation that treats another or a people without personhood, without humanity, then you can just slaughter them all. Because they don't matter. They're not people. So we have to have a heart of peace. So one time, Jesus is eating with Simon the Pharisee. You remember this story? It's in Luke 7. He's eating there. They're all there to test him. The scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders, they're all there testing him. And... A woman comes in, interrupts the dinner, goes to Jesus' feet and weeps at his feet. And her tears fall from her face and fall on the feet of Jesus. And she takes her hair and she wipes his feet. Do you remember this story? Yeah. And do you remember what Simon said? Jesus can't be a prophet if he were a prophet. He would know what kind of woman this is. Now, 
How did Simon see the woman? As a person or an object? How did he see Jesus? As a person or an object? But you remember what Jesus did? He said, I came into this house and you gave me no signs of hospitality. No oil for my head, water for my feet, none of the various signs of hospitality that you would do in those days. But she has wept over my feet and wiped my feet with her hair. And this story will be told of her. And if you could accept it, she is preparing me for my burial. Now, did Jesus treat her as an object or a person? No one can force us to have a heart of war. No one can do that. I don't care how mean they are, how dastardly they are. We can have a heart of peace because we've got this sign. God came to be with us. He came to be with us and to show us how much he values our personhood. He became one of us. And he didn't come all grown up. That would have been too easy. Came as a baby. As vulnerable as any of us. Why? Because he values us as people. So you want to have a good Christmas? Do you want to have a peaceful Christmas? Do we? I do. <laughs> but according to this... It starts with my heart, mine. I can treat people as objects or people. I can treat myself as an object or a person. But Jesus, his love, can open my eyes to see another's personhood.